There was a time in the early to mid 2010s that movie theaters weren't exclusively ruled by superhero films. There were still plenty of other genres and even subgenres that were doing incredibly well. Perhaps one of the strangest subgenres to find success during this time was the era of teenage dystopian films. Why is this a strange subgenre? Well, it's because of how specific it is. A dystopia refers to an imagined state or society in which there is great suffering or injustice, typically one that is totalitarian or post-apocalyptic. There's plenty of other dystopian movies like Blade Runner, Oblivion, Planet of the Apes, Children of Men, Snowpiercer, but none of these have teenagers as the central focus. So take this very specific genre and mix it in with teenagers, and you have three franchises that were the talk of the time. Perhaps even more strangely is that all of these films performed at least mostly well among fans and critics, and as quickly as they came, they vanished. There's been a few others make their appearance over the years or even during that time, but they never became as fully realized as some of these other franchises. Today there aren't really any popular teen dystopia films out there making this subgenre one of the quickest fads that I can remember. But there were three franchises that really nailed this whole teen dystopia thing on its head. The three franchises are The Hunger Games, The Maze Runner, and Divergent. So with this genre being all but dead, which one of these series stands as the best one? In this video, I'm going to be going over my thoughts and opinions on each of these three franchises, as well as awarding these categories after it's all said and done. So take your seats, let's travel back to the mid-2010s where these movies were all the craze, and let's talk about which one of these stories does teenage dystopia the best. We start off where the popularity of this whole genre was basically birthed with The Hunger Games. It's worth noting at the very start that without The Hunger Games, none of these other movies would have been made. And I'm not too sure about the books, but the books might have not even been written without The Hunger Games either. The Hunger Games centers around a fictitious future of the United States called Pan Am, where the country is divided into 12 districts. Each district focuses on a certain aspect. District 3 is technology, District 7 is lumber, 9 is grain, and so on and so forth. Each year there's an annual Hunger games where a teenage boy and a teenage girl are taken from each district to fight to the death in an arena. Our central character is Katniss Everdeen from the coal mining district 12. When her little sister gets chosen for the Hunger Games, Katniss volunteers for her and has to go through the games. She then goes on to win the games, be put back in them the following year just for her to break the games, and then becomes the face of the rebellion to go against the evil authority. Watching these films again makes me realize how dark this world really is. I was in like middle school when I read these books and watched the films, and I knew it was a dark story, but I had no idea just how dark it really was until recently. Particularly in the first film, the amount of hoops that the studio had to go through in order to make this movie PG-13 is astounding. The cornucopia scene is almost unwatchable due to the amount of shaky cam, it makes Cloverfield look like a steady camera, but it was necessary to achieve the rating because it's kind of hard to get away with a bunch of teenagers murdering each other and have it be family friendly. The second film got away with a lot more. There's a noticeable budget increase and also just simply because of the way the story went, they were allowed to show the games a bit more clearly because it wasn't all kids killing each other, it was adults killing each other, so you know, that's okay to show. The actual arena itself is also much cooler and the supporting characters are also much better this time around. While each of the games build up the momentum of the series and make each film progressively bigger and better, the third film decided to halt all of that progress so that way they can go and make a movie during during the rebellion. A lot of this plot feels like scenes that should have been left on the cutting room floor, but everything was thrown in to pad out the runtime so that way they could make this final book into two films. This entire film, like most films with part one in its title, is just setting up the bulk of the story for part two. There's a few redeeming factors, but this movie is largely forgettable. Part two, the culmination of the entire series, surely goes out with a bang, right? Well, kinda. It's better than part one for sure, they try to pull off some kind of resemblance to the games, and I think that the ending is actually pretty good, but this movie suffers from trying to do too much at once. In terms of the actual series itself, I was pretty surprised when I remembered some of the actors they got for this series. 
You have Woody Harrelson, who plays Hamish, easily the best character throughout the entire series, Jeffrey Wright as Beatty, Stanley Tucci as Caesar Flickerman, Elizabeth Banks as Effie Trinket, Philip Seymour Hoffman as Plutarch Heavensby, oh my god, these names are ridiculous, and then there's so many more. This cast is excellent, and pair that with the lead actress Jennifer Lawrence, who would go on to win an Oscar a few years later, and you have a very memorable series of films. As an adaptation itself, at least from what I can remember, The Hunger Games is largely very faithful to its source material. Of course, they split up the last book into two movies because they could make more money off of it, and that was really the downfall of The Hunger Games. Rebellions are hard to write, and they're especially hard to do correctly on screen, and both Mockingjay movies highlight the worst parts of The Hunger Games. There was absolutely no reason to split this 390 page book into two movies. There's not enough source material to break this into two two-hour movies, if anything it breaks it up too much. Not only was splitting the book into two films a bad idea, but the storyline itself just kind of sucks. Like I said, rebellions are hard to write and do correctly, and the rebellion in Mockingjay is easily near the bottom of the rebellions that I've seen in movies. What worked with the Hunger Games was the actual Hunger Games itself. When you take that incredibly interesting aspect away from it, then you're left with a very bland rebellion that's been done hundreds of times before. It's trying to subvert the expectations of the viewers by showing a more grounded and realistic version of a rebellion, but it just comes off as boring. Katniss doesn't really do anything other than give speeches, and while this might be a unique way to present someone leading a rebellion, it's not very interesting to watch. Is The Hunger Games a young adult series? Really the series you should try and rewrite this whole rebellion trope? It tries to be far more serious than it has any right to be, while also focusing very heavily on the love triangle in movies 3 and 4, so the whole tone just feels completely conflicted. I will say I admire the effort of trying to mix things up and present a rebellion storyline a bit differently, and it might work for some people, but it definitely didn't work for me. You set up this very interesting world and concept in the first two movies, get everybody excited for this final act of the story overtaking the authority, but it turns out to be very bland. So when literally half of your movies aren't that great, that's a pretty big issue. These final two movies left a very bad taste in my mouth when it comes to this genre, but this time around I gave the other movies a shot, so let's get into what I think is the second most successful teenage dystopian set of movies, The Maze Runner. The Maze Runner centers on a boy named Thomas who wakes up in the Glade, a safe haven surrounded by a giant maze. Having no memory of how he got there or who he is, Thomas and the rest of the boys work together to get out of the maze. When they do, they enter into a post-apocalyptic world overrun with infected. They learn that they can hold the key to making a cure, making this new generation of vital importance. One of the things that really separates The Maze Runner is how different each film is from the previous one. The first film obviously takes place in the maze. Everything is very green and gray and more or less medieval looking. In the second film, the group traverses across the desert, making the film look very orange and yellow because they're out in the world. There's a lot of modern looking things, but they're all broken down and post-apocalyptic. The third film largely takes place in the last city, so there's a lot of different blues and reds and actual modern looking weaponry. These aspects are small, but they add so much to differentiate the series and make it always seem fresh. Along with the different color palettes, there's the different enemies in each film too. The first film gives us a kind of like supernatural monster with the Grievers, these weird bug mechanical spiders, and they felt really out of place for being so mechanical, but it was also a hint towards what was coming in future installments, so I kind of liked that aspect and how it added to the mystery. In the second film, we get introduced to the Infected, which, unpopular opinion here, but these Infected really reminded me of the Infected from The Last of Us. And dare I say it, they're actually a bit scarier than the infected in The Last of Us. I've seen that The Last of Us was an inspiration for these infected, and that's very clearly seen, but I actually think it might even look a little bit better. And in the third movie, the primary antagonists are actual human villains. There's a moment where the resistance goes in and attacks the final city, and while the final city wasn't exactly inhabited by good people, it was still a very safe place in the world ravaged by infected people, and it really made you think twice about who the good guys were versus who the bad guys were. 
It actually reminded me a bit of Game of Thrones Season 8, but in a good way, and I didn't even know that was possible. Also, I didn't really know how to weave this in with the essay, but in the second film, they go into this mall. There's eight people in their company, but when they leave the mall, there's only seven of them. This no-name kid doesn't die, he just disappears and is never heard from or talked about ever again. It's like the others just completely forget about him. You thought I wouldn't notice a nameless character disappear, didn't you, movie? Well, can't pull one over on me like that. And to, I think, everyone's surprise, they didn't actually split the final book into two movies. I think there were a lot of reasons for this, number one being the book is only 325 pages. So there's just no need for it, but also Dylan O'Brien got really badly injured during one of the stunts for the third movie, putting the entire production on hiatus for another year. The first movie came out in 2014, the second movie in 2015, and the third in 2018. And by 2018, this whole teenage dystopian era was largely dying out, so a part two of this franchise might have not even been financially viable. Listen, Scott. It's no longer financially viable. We're losing money. With the exception of Thomas and Teresa, the supporting cast of characters are all your pretty standard archetype of characters. There's nothing wrong with any of them, I wouldn't go as far as to say to call them bland, but they're certainly characters we've seen a lot of times before. In terms of an adaptation, The Maze Runner is not very good at sticking to its source material. The first movie is pretty close in terms of its book counterpart, but both the second and third movie are wildly different from their book counterpart. But does this make these movies inherently worse off? Honestly, no. If there's any hardcore Maze Runner fans watching, you'll probably disagree with me on that one. I did read these books in, I think, like early high school, but I only ever watched the first movie up until recently. I don't really remember much from the second or third book, so watching these movies seemed like a very new experience to me, probably because it was. If I had reread these books before going in, I'd probably have a different opinion, but I didn't, so as of right now, my opinion on these films is that they're all pretty good. Right from the start, there's an inherent mystery that you want answers to. What is this place? Who put all of these people here, and who is Thomas really? There's plenty of hints throughout the films about a larger mystery taking place, and while the mystery does kind of dissolve in the third film and become a pretty typical post-apocalyptic story, there's a lot of heart within the story and the characters themselves. I said that the characters were basically all standard archetypes, but they're archetypes for a reason. If it's not broken, don't fix it. While there's a lot of very creative names for things. Those are the runners. Well, we call them Grievous. The box. We called it the flare. And lots of last minute saves. Oh my god, Harry's? I really feel like this series of films embraces what it is and doesn't take itself too seriously. There's not really this big commentary on society. These are adventure films with teenagers in a post-apocalyptic world, and as far as those kinds of stories go, this is probably one of the better ones. Well, now we've gone over those two, time to talk about the black sheep of the teen dystopian era with the Divergent series. While all these movies share a lot of common themes and tropes, Divergent really does come across as just a copycat Hunger Games story. We're introduced to different districts, I mean houses, I mean factions, there's the ultra smart and evil erudite, the straight edge truth tellers candor, the hippie amity clan, the boring abnegation, and the frat brother dauntless. It's very clear early on that if Triss went into any of the other factions besides Dauntless, then this movie would be extremely boring. They have to take a test to tell you which faction you belong in, but then you can also choose whatever faction you want to be in anyways, so the test is kind of pointless. When Triss takes the test, she doesn't belong to just one faction, she belongs to all factions, meaning that she's divergent. Divergents are dangerous to the New World Order, so luckily she has the one test administrator that tells her all of this and doesn't report her to the authorities. So Triss chooses Dauntless and forsakes her family, and so does her brother because Abnegation is the District 12 of factions and they're extremely boring. So Trist has to go through all these trials in order to become a Dauntless, and if she doesn't get ranked above a certain number, she gets thrown out of Dauntless and becomes factionless. This is kind of weird, doesn't really seem to be any actual reason for it. They say it's a new thing that they've added to the faction, so that's, I guess, whatever. But it adds some actual stakes to the story, so it's not bad. 
So Triss goes through all these frat initiations in order to secure her spot, all while falling in love with the instructor whose name is Four. Where this movie and I suppose the series separates itself from the Hunger Games is its use of these like dream sequences. Triss is very good at overcoming these obstacles because she's divergent and can tell that these dream sequences aren't real and it makes her a target for the erudite faction trying to take over the world. She finds out that her love instructor is also divergent and he teaches her how to overcome these dream obstacles while not breaking them and this aspect is fun and really different from the other films. In the third act, the Erudite starts mind controlling the Dauntless in order to commit mass genocide on the boring faction, Abnegation, so it's up to Divergent, Triss, and Four to stop the evil Kate Winslet from carrying out these plans. So they do, and then they just leave her there so that way they can escape on the train. All in all, this movie actually isn't half bad. You can tell this was a popular genre, so the budget had been increased for these kinds of movies. This one has a higher budget than the first Hunger Games movie did. Not by much, but it's definitely noticeable from the get-go. I will say its use of licensed Ellie Goulding music during the scenes completely dates this movie far more than any of the other films, and in 2023, it just comes across as really cheesy. So after a pretty solid start, I was thinking, well, maybe these movies just aren't as good as the others, so they're rated poorly. But no, that is not the case. At the start of the second movie, the characters all talk about how they have to kill the evil Kate Winslet. Oh, you mean the woman that you had every opportunity to kill at the end of the last movie but didn't for some reason? This movie is filled with decisions that don't make a whole lot of sense and is very clearly setting up yet another rebellion arc, which I was thinking, Ah oh, shit, here we go again. But the third act of this film actually changes things up when they open the MacGuffin of the film. It's a message from somebody beyond the wall, because of course there's a giant wall, saying that all of this was really a test and now they can come out beyond the wall to reunite with the rest of humanity. It's actually a nice twist, now pretty reminiscent of the Maze Runner when they go out beyond the maze, but still a nice twist. The second movie was not very good. And this might be a little bit mean to say, but this haircut is just awful on Shailene Woodley. Not taking a dig at anybody with this haircut, but it does not work in this movie. She looks like Arya when she was trying to be a boy back in season 2, and I just could not get on board with this look at all. One of the bright spots of the film is Four. He has a very interesting dynamic with both of his parents, his father that beat him into leaving his original faction, and his mother who abandoned him and is now the leader of the factionless. Theo James puts on a really good performance, and he's infinitely more interesting than Triss is. Even some of the other side characters like Miles Teller's Peter and Ansel Elgort's Caleb make very interesting decisions. So that brings us to the third movie, Allegiant. With the newfound news of there being life outside the walls, the group goes to meet them and all seems well, until these people turn out to be evil too. So they go through some more shenanigans, foiling the evil Jeff Bridges' plans, but at the end of the movie, he's not dead, and he'll be back for more. Or he won't. Yep, that's right, after this trilogy and this third movie being part one of part two, and that cliffhanger ending at the end of it, the series just ends. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons and a lot of drama surrounding it. This movie did not do very well at the box office. It's no longer financially viable, we're losing money. So the sequel, basically Allegiant Part 2, was cancelled. Instead, they wanted to release a TV movie with a reduced budget, and then after the movie, a TV show would have come from it for some reason, but Shailene Woodley hated this idea and she said that she would only come back if it was a theatrical film. So because it wasn't gonna be, and they were gonna move ahead with the TV movie, she dropped out of it. After she said she was leaving, there was basically no interest from the rest of the cast or the executives, so another movie was and is never going to be made. This just like inherently makes this series the worst one because it's not even a complete story. And honestly, that kinda sucks. There were some interesting characters, and all three of these movies were at least like fun B-movies. It had a really great cast from the supporting roles to the younger actors who are now very big stars. Would it have been nice to get an actual ending? Yeah, but if it went the route of the TV movie with like no budget and a recast main character, it probably would have ended up being even worse. These movies probably look the best out of all the movies when it comes to special effects. They did have a really big budget, and a lot of the CGI looks better than most modern Marvel movies. 
I actually feel bad for the Divergent series and everybody involved in it. They weren't like god-awful trash films, they weren't anything amazing, but I'm sure this series had its fair share of fans, and for those people to never see the ending kinda sucks. Obviously there's the books, but the films never got the treatment that the other two series did, and at the end of the day, that's really unfortunate. Now for the moment everybody's been waiting for, probably not. It's time to award these series for their time in the mainstream limelight that they had for like half a decade. Because there's no groups of people to decide these things and it's just me voting for these categories, prepare yourself for immeasurable disappointment. Starting off with the lower categories that aren't as important, just like all the awards shows do, we start with Best Supporting Character. This award is very easily claimed by Hamish Abernathy. Like I said during the Hunger Games portion, Hamish is easily my favorite character in this franchise. Because all these stories are very formulaic hero's journey stories, Hamish takes on the role of the mentor, but that's quite literally what he's called on their way to the games, and there's something about that like meta quality that I actually really like. Thought to just be the stupid drunk, you see that Hamish is actually very smart, and there's a reason why he won the games in the first place. Because the books take place from Katniss's point of view and Katniss's point of view only, you get some very interesting scenes of Hamish around the capital and stuff like that, scheming to get money for the airdrops and just generally looking down at these people's way of life, and all of these additions are fantastic. Of course, it's also Woody Harrelson who never turns in a bad performance, and Hamish is up there with my favorite of his performances. Next up, we have the best main character, and this might surprise people, but I'm gonna go with Thomas. The mystery behind his backstory is really thoroughly developed and his character arc from being somebody who worked with the enemy to being somebody against the enemy is really great. And like I mentioned, Maze Runner really leans into what kind of story it is and embraces its genre, so having Thomas essentially be the chosen one in a hero's journey story makes him stand out from the others because this story wasn't trying to rewrite the history book and present something different. Thomas was a hero to root for, and I think Dylan O'Brien easily outacts any of the other protagonists in these movies. Yes, Jennifer Lawrence won an Oscar, but Katniss gets a little unbearable in the third and fourth movies, and I'm the only one who votes on these things, so the crown goes to Thomas. Next up we have the best world. Which of these is the most unique to the others? Which one offers the most story opportunity and separates itself from not only the other worlds here, but the other worlds of all other movies? This one has to go to Pan Am of The Hunger Games. While I didn't like the rebellion aspect of this series, the world itself of The Hunger Games is brilliant. It's dark and cruel and really has no place being a PG-13 series, but whatever. The thing that works in The Hunger Games are the games themselves because of how brutal they really are. I've said it before, but I really think this universe is a goldmine for an anthology series. A new movie or season or book showing a new tribute from a different district and their time in the games would be a really great series to follow. All the different unique biomes and the characters they encounter during their time would be really cool to see. Heck, Hogwarts Legacy has me thinking that this could be a brilliant video game. Make it like Madden or something and you can create your own games, play as a player or as a game maker, that could be a lot of fun. So the best world goes to The Hunger Games. Next up is the best story. You can have great characters and a great world, but if your story sucks, then you don't really have anything. While I do think all three stories are comparable to each other, I gotta hand this one to the Maze Runner series. All three movies are unique from each other in a lot of different ways. This leans into its young adult nature and delivers an exciting adventure with mystery elements spread throughout. There's a lot of heart between the connection of the characters, and having the world get progressively bigger with each installment is exactly what a sequel should do, and it does it really well here. It's the most well-rounded story of the three of them, and while not exactly groundbreaking, I think it's my personal favorite story of the three. All three of these stories were based on books, so which one did the adaptation the best? The Maze Runner 2 and 3 were wildly different from the books, and Divergent didn't even get the ending of its story, so this one easily gets handed to The Hunger Games. While I can complain about Mockingjay all I want to, it is the direction that the books went in, and it is the most similar to its book counterpart, so The Hunger Games wins Best Adaptation. Here's a big one, and I didn't really want to give it away by going into so much detail during the segment, but the best movie of these 10 films is, by a landslide, Catching Fire. The first Hunger Games movie is a great movie, and the second one improves on literally every aspect. 
There's this one scene during the montage of the tour around the districts where a young girl goes up to Katniss and says, oh, she wants to volunteer just like she did. And Katniss is just realizing what she's inspiring is the wrong thing to do and something needs to change. And I remember the first time I watched that scene, I just knew that this movie was on a completely different level than the previous one. This movie is darker, acted better, directed better because the cornucopia scene isn't children killing one another, contains better characters, a better story. Everything about this movie separates itself greatly from the rest of the films on this list, and if I go to rewatch a Hunger Games movie, it's almost always catching fire. We've come to the end, time for the big award of the night, Best Overall Series. Which combination of story, world, and characters takes home the big prize? While I think it's very easy to say The Hunger Games because without it the other two wouldn't exist, I'm gonna go with The Maze Runner. For a lot of the same reasons as the best story, I think that these three movies are all of similar quality to one another, maybe a little dip in quality towards the end, but nothing major that makes me not want to rewatch the entire series like The Hunger Games or Divergent. So to wrap things up, let's go to the score chart. With three wins, we have The Maze Runner. With four wins, we have The Hunger Games. And a resounding zero wins, we have Divergent. I really tried to give up at least like one of these categories to Divergent, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I even tried making up a few like best love story or something like that, but Divergent wouldn't have even won that. At the end of the day, Divergent really got the short end of the stick in a lot of ways, and that's a shame because it's really not that bad of a series. If you're wondering, this is my list of all 10 films ranked, so at least the Divergent movies didn't come in dead last. They at least always had something going on and looked cool. Mockingjay Part 1 was just a gray movie with a lot of scenes that could have been deleted scenes, or just scenes that should have been taken out of the script entirely. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below about why I'm wrong for choosing Maze Runner over Hunger Games or anything else that I'm wrong about. Let me know which of these series is your favorite and if you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like and subscribe for more content like this. If you do, then I'll see you in the next one. Yeah.